And now, it's time to sit back and enjoy the Two True Freaks Internet Radio Broadcast. Attention, people, Earth. Do not resist us. All who oppose us shall be annihilated. We command the most powerful army of monsters in the universe. They are sure to defeat your Earth monsters. All those who are hearing this are now under the control of the Earth Destruction Directive. Hello everyone and welcome to Earth Destruction Directive. I am your host, Mr. Luke Giaconetti. I'd like to thank everyone for downloading and listening to the show today. Hope everyone enjoyed our last episode where we took a look at episodes 28 and 29 of the classic Ultraman series featuring the alien Dada and the fiscally irresponsible monster Goldon. This time out, we are switching gears a little bit. We are taking a look at a video game. We are taking a look specifically at SNK's King of the Monsters 2, The Next Thing, which is, of course, the sequel to SNK's original, King of the Monsters, which was covered on this show way back on episode 84. But before we get into the little video gaming action, let's get into the news, and we do have uh, quite a few things of news to cover. So starting out with Ultraman. Ultraman Anime Season 2 has dropped on Netflix, debuting Thursday, April 13th. Now, similar to the first season, uh, the all the episodes of the season dropped on Netflix on that date. And Netflix has been pushing notifications through for this show for a couple of weeks now, at least as I'm recording this. So they seem to have really high hopes for it. That or maybe their algorithm is just targeting me on this one. I am very eager to uh, to see this. I really enjoyed the first season. I've enjoyed what I've read of the manga. Interesting also is that Subaraya also put out a way, way, way advanced teaser for what they're calling Ultraman Final which is, I'm guessing, the final season of the anime, which is scheduled for 2023. So very, very cool to have that to look forward to. And uh, hot on the heels of Ultraman, the week after that was the debut of the second season slash second half of Pacific Rim the Black, which debuts on Netflix on April the 19th. Now, uh, um, this show never got as much play as Ultraman did, at least it didn't uh, in my circles, but I really enjoyed Pacific Rim the Black, and I'm very happy to get the the back half of it. Uh, My understanding is that this is going to be the the last, it's going to, last installment is going to finish up the series here. Uh, Very funny, we go a couple years without new episodes for either show, and they both come back within a week of each other. Oh, the irony. In other Ultra news, Ultra Galaxy Fight the Destined Crossroad is now coming to Ultraman Connection on a video-on-demand basis. Now, uh, like the previous Ultra Galaxy Fight series, this one will be available with English-dubbed audio as an option. Now, I can only assume that this series will thus now not be available on YouTube, like New Generation Heroes and The Absolute Conspiracy, Uh, But I can't confirm that. Now, no dates or pricing are available at this time. I'm going to update that as it becomes available. I know they put the prologue to uh, Dustin Crossroad on the Subaraya YouTube channel, but we haven't seen anything since that, and that was a couple of months ago. Uh, Similarly, even more Ultraman news. The first trailer for Ultraman Decker has been released on YouTube. This is the 25th anniversary of Ultraman Dyna, much like Ultraman Trigger was to Ultraman Tiga. Now, in the trailer, we do get to see our hero in his human form, as well as his transformation into Flash type, as well as previews of his strong and miracle types, again, keeping with the themes from Dinah. Uh, the name Decker seems to come from the cards, which are used as part of his transformation. Bandai does love trading cards, don't they? Uh, <laughs> so Ultraman Decker is set to debut July 9th on Tokyo TV. No word at this point. If it's coming to YouTube or not here in the West, I'm, I'm really hoping it is. I've really enjoyed watching Ultraman Zet and Ultraman Trigger on YouTube with the kids. And I, you know, I'm just curious. I'm curious what we're going to see on that. I haven't seen an announcement, but I don't really remember there being any announcements for Trigger coming to YouTube until very close to the series debut on YouTube. So, uh, We'll have to wait and see on that one. One last bit of Ultra news. Another trailer has dropped for Shin Ultraman. Yes, Shin Ultraman is still coming out next month. It's coming out May in Japan. 
I have not heard anything on if or when this is ever going to come to the West. And if it does in, in, you know, what capacity or what timeline. So just keep your eyes and ears peeled for that one. Hopefully we'll hear something else on that as we get closer to that, that May release date. Looks very cool. And, uh, you know, always cool to see a theatrical Ultraman. I know The Ultraman was a, uh, a very, very good movie, and I hope to cover that at some point here. So uh, keep your ears peeled for that. And one last bit of non-Ultraman news. I know, I'm getting a little, it's a lot of Ultra in this episode for an episode not covering Ultra. Yeti, giant of the 20th century, coming on Blu-ray from Kino Lore Bear. Yes, that is right. Boutique genre label Kino Lore Bear is releasing the infamous 1977 Italian King Kong ripoff on Blu-ray because this is the world we live in at this point. Now, there's been no special features announced. Uh, it is remastered from the original Italian 35mm camera negative, so it should look pretty, even if the movie is... Yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. That's up on Amazon. Uh, comes out sometime in May. Uh, I ordered it. It's for the podcast. Shout out to uh, Nathan Marchand. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, that's the best this movie's ever going to look, whether it deserves to look that good or not, is an entirely different question, which I do not have the time to address in this podcast. That's all the news I have. If you have any news or notes you want to send in, why don't you go ahead and hit me up, Directive at yahoo.com, and I will talk about it here on the show. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to get, uh, when we come back, we're going to get right into King of the Monsters 2, The Next Thing right here on Earth Destruction Directive. You know, I'm the kaiju guy now, thanks to the Monster Island Film Fault, but before that I was the superhero guy. I wonder if there's a way I could combine those. Hey, Nathan. Uh, Travis from Kaiju Weekly. Yeah, I'm here because I need a co-host for a new Toku Heroes podcast. Oh, what's it called? Him. Shin. Standing by. Complete. That's right, heroes. We are the Henshin Men, a Tokusatsu Superheroes Appreciation Podcast. Join us as we watch several episodes of a TV series from the wide world of Henshin heroes and discuss their merits and cultural significance. Starting with one of my all-time favorites, the original Kamen Rider from 1971. We'll give out awards for things like the best action scenes and crazy what the henshin moments. So hear us every Monday in your favorite podcatcher to get your weekly rider kicks. Gotta go, because we only have a minute to henshin it. And we are back here on Earth Destruction Directive. King of the Monsters 2, The Next Thing, was released in Japan on May 5th, 1992 for SNK's MVS platform, multi-video system, which was their arcade-based platform. The game was then released for the Neo Geo AES on June 1st, 1992, that's their home version of that hardware, and was ported to the Neo Geo CD as a launch title for that system on September 9th, 1994 in Japan. We would then get ports for the Super Nintendo on December 22nd, 1993, and then the Sega Genesis exclusively in North America sometime in 1994, both of those being released by Takara. Uh, the developer of this game, it's SNK, of course, Now Productions handled development for the SNES port, and then an outfit called BTOP handled development for the Genesis version. We will talk more about the Genesis version in a little bit. Uh, a little bit later here on the show. The publisher, of course, was SNK, and as I said, Takara was the publisher for the home versions. Uh, the designers are credited as Bobo Fukumitsu, Mitsuzui Ai, and Sakai Goma. Now, none of this team was credited as designers on the original game. I thought that was kind of interesting, and I couldn't, it was very difficult to find other credits for these individuals. Uh, unfortunately, some of these are, um, they, uh, SNK did this where they, they got, Sometimes designers would use um, either like, uh, you know, uh, pseudonyms or other names. And sometimes it's hard to track down exactly who worked on what for, for some of these. Uh, now, the producer of the game is Akichi Kawasaki, the founder of SNK and later the founder of their successor company, Playmore. Um, he is all over SNK stuff, as you can imagine, since he founded the company. Uh, so that, that name, at least, was very familiar. 
So our story, as taken from the back of the Neo Geo AES box, goes like this. In 1996, the country of Japan was devastated by the monster invasion. Six monsters did battle in the most destructive and terrifying catastrophe of all time. The war lasted three years and is known in the history books as the King of the Monsters Massacre. Three monsters survived and have become more advanced and dangerous than ever before. But now a new nemesis is on the scene. The alien invasion will be the biggest challenge for Earth's monstrosity. An unimaginable rumble that will rock the world. And this new war will certainly be coined by witnesses as the King of the Monsters 2 Confrontation. I always love when you tra uh, translate Japanese to English. It always sounds so dramatic. And I love that King of the Monsters took place in the far-flung year of 1996. That's, uh... I was listening to another show where they, they were talking about when things are set in the, the future from when it's made, but the past from when you're experiencing it. Always fun. Uh, so as I alluded to at the end of the last episode, there are two distinct versions of this game. There's the original arcade version, which was ported pretty much without change to the Super Nintendo. And then there's the Genesis version, which is quite a bit different. Now, we're going to talk about the arcade original first. I think it only makes sense to start there. That's the much more common and well-known version of this game. Now, in the arcade version, players can choose from three monsters, all upgraded versions of those same monsters from the first game. Uh, the characters are Super Gaon, the power character, Atomic Guy, the speed character, or Cyber Wu, the balance character. Now, these, of course, are the upgrades of Gaon, Astro Guy, and Wu. Uh, now, while Atomic Guy, he's fairly close to his original version, Astro Guy. Uh, the other two monsters are more distinctly different from their predecessors. Super Gaon, he's leaner, he's got a longer neck, much bigger back spikes, and more of a serpentine kind of build. He's still recognizable as the Godzilla riff in this game, but he does look a bit different from his original version. Wu, on the other hand, he's moved completely from being a King Kong type of character to a mecha monster, more akin to Mechanicon, appropriately. Now that said, Cyber Wu also embodies various super robot tropes, including firing banks of missiles from his back, splitting in half, and transforming himself into a weapons platform. And overall, the three-player characters are well-designed. They cover a lot of ground when it comes to heroic monsters, as far as I'm concerned. And I like that those were the three they picked. Those kind of make sense as the heroic monsters, right? The Godzilla riff, the King Kong riff, who you also use to tie in the super robots, and then the Ultraman riff. So that those, that those become the player characters here makes perfect sense. Now, the game can be done either one or two players, and unlike the wrestling-slash-fighting mechanic of the first game, King of the Monsters 2 is instead a beat-em-up game, a three-quarters side-scrolling beat-em-up. Players move through the stage battling enemies. Initially, these are uh, SDF mecha and later smaller alien monsters, and destroying buildings and other parts of the environment. Now, hidden among the terrain are power-ups, allowing your monster to advance, up two additional power levels, which changes their color and unlocks more special attacks. At the end of the stage, there's a boss monster to battle. Now at this point, the boss battles a game more closely resembles the original, as grappling plays an integral role in the fights. Uh, there are seven stages to fight your way through, each one getting progressively more difficult, of course. Hey everyone, Luke here with a late note. So evidently there is in fact a two-player versus mode that you can get in King of the Monsters 2. I have never been able to play this, and since I only have this on my Switch and I only have a Switch Lite, I can't even try it on the version that I have. According to the manual, each player picks one of the player monsters, you can't pick the same monster, and you fight a best, uh, best three out of five battle to determine the winner. Uh, again, never played it, so I can't say and to, to the specifics, but it does apparently exist. So, back to the show. Uh, I do want to note that for the purposes of this review, I'm going to be using the Western names for these monsters. Uh, that's the region where I'm located, first off. But other than the names, the monsters themselves are unchanged in the different regions. So, First up, we have the monster Huge Frogger in the super creatively named American City. Frogger is, as his name implies, a giant bipedal frog monster who appears to be wearing a helmet. Now, for all the world, this guy reminds me of a daikaiju take on the Predator with his mottled skin and silver helmet. Uh, Frogger can teleport around the, st uh, the stage. He strikes with elbow blades, kind of like the Giver, 
and he can spit a laser beam from his mouth. Now, actually, his flashiest move is his grapple, where he presses his opponent over his head, like a gorilla press, leaps up off the screen, and crashes back down, which is very cool. And especially for a, it's very kind of flashy move. It's kind of your, it's right in the first stage, and it's already a, a crazier move than anything in the first game. Uh, the stage is similar to the cityscapes in the first game. Uh, this one's sort of a hodgepodge of American tropes. Uh, we get the World Trade Center, we get a baseball stadium, we even get a space shuttle launch site. Uh, Huge Frogger, not too much of a challenge, has a great look. I think this is done to lure in unsuspecting kids in the arcades, as we will soon see. Uh, the next monster is Eiffelite in the French city, which is sort of a proxy version of France. Eiffelite starts out very small at the end of the stage, and as you attack him, he begins to grow giant, soon reaching his full height. Uh, Eiffelite, uh, his name, of course, a play on the Eiffel Tower, which is included in the stage, reminds me sort of of the Toa Frankenstein. He's a giant mutated humanoid. Uh, he look, it looks like he has a mop of stringy red hair, but this is actually the alien parasite himself. And uh, what he does is he takes over a human host and makes them grow giant and sucks off their energy. Uh, now, this is, the head can fire beams from its bug eyes. It can turn you to stone. It can also suck out your energy. Um, Eiffelite is a substantially more challenging foe. Uh, he's able to stretch his limbs out for longer range attacks, sort of like Dalsum from Street Fighter II. And he's got a body slam grapple where he grabs you and then slams you back and forth over his head. And uh, that eats up your health very quickly. It only takes, I think, three of those to wipe out a complete uh, health meter, which is, uh, that's, that, that doesn't take long. Uh, now, if you do manage to defeat him, you now have to face him as an alien. So it, you defeat the body, and then it's just a little alien head flying around. And if you can get that one down low enough in health, it now splits in two, so you have to beat both of them. Uh, <laughs> Eiffelite is one of my favorite monsters from the game. He's not as crazy as some of his other cohorts, but he is really a great enemy monster. And like I said, really reminds me of the Toho Frankenstein, uh, a humanoid type monster like that. Very, um, and, and it's, like I said, that grapple move is a lot of fun. It's just a, a really cool monster and a very nicely designed stage as well. Up next, the third stage is the Grand Canyon, and our enemy is Clawhead who is a little hard to explain. Now, Clawhead has a mouth at the base of his trunk, which leads up into a long neck topped with two faces, each face having a large horn on top of it. He has two arm-like legs. They bend kind of like your arm at the elbow, uh, with have reverse knees, and, uh, yeah, a set of eyes inside that big mouth. So, like, he can open his mouth and a big set of eyes pop out, in addition to the eyes on each of the heads, on top of the necks. Um, he's sort of like the monster Twin Tail from Ultraman in body shape, but unlike Twin Tail, he has the heads on top instead of a face on the bottom, if that makes any sense. I don't know if any of you are familiar with, with, with Twin Tail. Uh, anyway, you know, that said, Clawhead has several powerful and weird attacks. Uh, he launches a long tongue from his mouth, which does like a sprite stretching in a very similar fashion to Poison Ghost's attack from the first game, if you remember that one, where he would stretch his hand out. Clawhead also burrows his heads underground, and he pops up and attacks someplace else, which can be hard to predict, because you're not sure exactly where he's going to pop up. The stage looks appropriately like the Grand Canyon, plenty of reddish rocks and scrubby brushland. Uh, Clawhead is the strangest enemy so, so far in the game, very memorably designed. Um, now this statement goes for just about everybody in this game, but man, Clawhead would make a great toy. And I really, uh, would have liked to see SNK go down that road, but, uh, oh well. Up next is the monster Beetle Master, who is located in the desert, which is clearly an XP for Egypt, given the presence of the Great Pyramid, from under which Beetle Master appears. I didn't realize that the Great Pyramid was on caster wheels, but it's a game, we're gonna let it go. Uh, Beetle Master looks like a mutated update of Beetle Mania from the original, uh, right down to his uh, yellow and fleshy pink color scheme, which is uh, pretty much carried over from Beetle Mania. Uh, now he has six limbs, he has two mammalian hands and four insectoid legs, a single eye and a gaping mouth right in the middle of his thorax, and a domed humanoid brain atop his head. Beetle Master's most interesting attack is a long-range shot where he kind of bends his head over and fires his domed brain off like a cannonball, 
and then it comes back in. It'll hit you either going out or coming back in. Now, like Iphalite, Beelmaster also has a late stage form change where he will make a copy of himself, forcing you to defeat two of them at the same time. Uh, the stage itself is made up of dunes and other desert scenery. Uh, in the beat em up portion, you do have to watch out for swirly sand whirlpools that will drag you across the stage. Uh, Beetlemaster is a very, very well designed monster. I like him quite a lot. He is just recognizable enough as an insect, but also just crazy enough to fit in with the motif of this game. Uh, he is one of my favorites in this in this game, by uh, for sure, and has been from the very beginning. The fifth enemy is called Sea Slug, and his stage is the Sea Bed. Sea Slug is a giant mollusk of some kind with a large shell. Uh, the least humanoid monster in the game, Sea Slug has no real limbs, although he does stretch part of his body out into be a makeshift fist for one of his attacks. Uh, the stage itself is quite neat, resembling an underwater military base or city, so it's all dark blues and grays, and you're fighting on the bottom of it, and you see like um, you know, little domed... Uh, cities and portions of it on the on the uh, the seabed floor, so that was pretty neat. Uh, there's also a large trench on one side, which you can knock Sea Slug into, although he simply reappears without any ill effect. That would have been kind of a cheat if you could just knock him into the trench and he was gone. Now, Sea Slug's most nifty special attack involves spinning himself in a circle, from which he creates a giant whirlpool, or I guess water spout, which is the height of the screen. And if it hits you, it will spin you around all the way up and then drop you down to the floor, uh, creating uh, quite a lot of damage. Sea Slug is not the flashiest monster, but he is a good addition, and I do like his stage quite a bit, so I'm glad that he's in here. It gives us something a little bit different. We had not had a stage where we fought underwater before, and, you know, that's not an uncommon thing in a Daikaiju setting to fight underwater. The last of the regular enemies is called Lavacus, who is in the aptly named Lava Zone. Lavacus is a flying gremlin sort of monster. He's got two bat wings coming out of his back, long arms with long fingers, three oversized eyes above a gigantic gaping mouth, and an antenna of sorts on his head from which he spits eggs, which hatch into smaller monsters, because that's not gross. Uh, his body tapers off down to a small tail, and he floats around the stage. A very bizarre monster for sure. Uh, a toy of him would need a flying stage of some kind, uh, as, you know, if he was a figure or a model kit. The stage is a volcano bed with spouts of lava to avoid, and a volcanic cone which is smoking endlessly, which is really cool. I like that part. It's a great backdrop for a Japanese giant monster fight for sure, you know, fighting in front of a volcano. Lavacus is just so insane looking that he's almost hard to take seriously, if I'm being honest. Uh, but by this point, the game itself has become so thoroughly difficult that it doesn't matter how goofy he might look, he's still, you know, beating you from pillar to post, because it's an SNK game, and they're all supremely difficult. Uh, the final boss is called Famardi. He's called King Famardi in Japan. A uh, better name, in my opinion, adding the word king on the final boss just makes sense. And you battle Famardi at the secret enemy hideout, which is located underneath the volcano from Lavacus's Lava Zone stage. Hey everyone, Luke here once again. Just wanted to point out that I forgot to mention a pretty major aspect of the last stage, in that before you get to go fight King Famardi, you have to do that old chestnut of fighting all the bosses again. Yes, inside the secret uh, enemy HQ, you do in fact fight all of the enemies once again, and they fight very much like they do in their regular stages. This means that you have to fight the Iphalite alien and uh, at the end of that fight, and you have to fight Beetlemaster. He splits into two at the end of his fight. So uh, just get those quarters ready if you're in the arcade, if that's all I've got to say about that. All right, back to the episode. Famardi is a giant, scaly green blob monster. He's got a row of bulbous orange eyes on the top of his body, two clawed orange hands emerging from the sides, and a giant toothy mouth. And of course, out of that mouth is a long, segmented tongue, ending with a human-like face, because he's the final boss, he's got to look really bizarre. Uh, Famardi is almost as tall as the entire screen, and he actually shares several projectile attacks with the other bosses. Now, his size makes him a really big target, but he also has tons of health, so it's kind of a trade-off there. Now, if you manage to defeat him, uh, he breaks into about a dozen, I think it might actually be 15, uh, smaller pieces, smaller little eyeballs, 
that uh, begin to scurry all over the place. Now, the number of the little Fomardis you get to kill here within the time limit actually determines how good of an ending you get, which I think is pretty funny. Now, once you kill all the little monsters or run out of time, the secret HQ begins to explode. Your monster is launched out of the volcano, and you are the strongest monster yet again. Um, now, top to bottom, this is a great set of new monsters, both with the updates to the returning as well as the brand new enemies. It's a shame that the franchise did not continue after this, uh, because personally, I would have liked to see how some of these monsters evolved into the next game. You know, the, when we take a look at how the original monsters evolved into this one, and see what that, that next stage of evolution would have been. So the change to the beat-em-up format does make the game feel quite a bit different. In the early stages, the SDF and small alien enemies are not too much of a threat, but they quickly step up, dealing good amounts of damage. Additionally, while there are power-ups and health hidden in the terrain, there are also hurtful items, including bombs and power downs that you have to watch out for. I mean, starting at level 3, the Grand Canyon, it can be difficult to make it through the stage to even get to the boss without losing a life. Now, the controls do a decent job in brawling duty. You have a punch, kick, and jump button. You can pick up some parts of the environment and some vehicles to throw them. And there's a series of special moves you can unleash by charging one of the three buttons as you improve, as you uh, upgrade your level from level 1 to level 2 to level 3, the different charge buttons become active. It's not a complex beat-em-up style like Streets game like Streets of Rage. It's more akin to earlier games, kind of like Final Fight, in that it doesn't have um, as many uh, attacks that you can make. It's more basic number of attacks. The boss characters themselves can really only be described as, well, SNK-like. The original was a tough game from a one-player perspective, but it was feasible to at least have a chance to beat the computer. Here, however, the difficulty ramps up quickly and never looks back. Grappling against bosses is almost impossible. You can typically win the first grapple you make in each life, but beyond that, the bosses will win nearly everything else. This is very challenging when it usually only takes two to three grapple attacks to empty your health bar. Remember what I said about Eiffelite and his body slam attack. It doesn't help that it's not clear what determines how you win a grapple. Is it timing like a Fire Pro game, or is it button mashing? Neither approach seems to work consistently here, and I have not found anything online of somebody to make that determination. About the only benefit you have is that you no longer must pin your enemy. Emptying their health bar will do the trick this time out. This opens up the possibility of doing hit-and-run style attacks with a lot of strikes, but that only goes so far. Essentially, this game is designed to eat quarters and keep you playing, and man, it does a good job of it. Not a surprising move for an SNK arcade game, but it is a little frustrating. Now, admittedly, I am playing it on my Switch, so those credits are free, but I can honestly say I never advanced too far in the arcade because of the difficulty level. Mixed in there are a couple of bonus stages, which take the form of a button-mashing sumo match against one of the other player monsters. Again, at the standard difficulty level, these are extremely challenging. But, you know, hey, it's a bonus level. I can't complain too much, right? Now, for the arcade original, King of the Monsters 2 elicits kind of mixed emotions for me. Visually, it's an upgrade over its predecessor, with its wild monster designs and expanded locales. It's more ambitious as well, with more characters, more varied gameplay, bonus levels, and even this slightly less rudimentary story. Not exactly deep, but a little bit more going on. But the level of difficulty makes the game, as I said, a little frustrating. And this is not just a situation where I'm bad at the game, so I'm complaining. This style of gameplay, where the bosses do major damage to you out of grapples, which you seemingly cannot win, forces you to fight a battle of attrition. There's not any real clear way to just, you know, play smart in King of the Monsters 2 and win. You just keep pumping in quarters. Now that said, I must give SNK credit. The designers have assembled a game that you want to put more quarters into, because you want to see that next wild stage and insane enemy monster. In this sense, the game is a bit easier for me to swallow playing on the Switch, where the credits are freely created just by hitting the L button, and don't cost me quarters out of my change cup. I think if you like the original, or a monster fan who was playing video games in the 1990s, you will most likely dig King of the Monsters too. Those looking for a superlative monster beat-em-up style game will unfortunately be more likely to see the game as unfair and move on. King of the Monsters 2 cannot hold a candle to the top beat-em-ups out there, which play a bit more honestly with the player, if I'm being, you know, from my opinion. Personally, 
I was happy to pick it up on the eShop and finally have that original version, even if I still find myself yelling at the screen sometimes when I just need one more move to finish a boss. <laughs> now, if you'd like to play the arcade original, you do have a few options. King of the Monsters 2 is part of the ACA Neo Geo program, which is a subset of Hamster Corporation's Arcade Archive series. Now, that main Arcade Archive series consists of 203 different arcade games, but the ACA Neo Geo series is 108 different specific Neo Geo titles, emulated to create the original arcade experience for those games. Now, the game can be purchased from the respective online shops for the Nintendo Switch, which is, as I said, where I have it, uh, the Sony PlayStation 4, and the Microsoft Xbox One. It can also be bought on PCs through the Microsoft Store. Now, the Super Nintendo port, as near as I can tell, has not been made available in any legal emulated form, but if you can find a copy, you can always play it on your vintage SNES or one of those retro-compatible consoles on the market if you'd like. There seems to be several options out there for the Super Nintendo. I never owned a Super Nintendo, and I have no real loyalty to the system, so I, I don't have a lot of information on that. Um, if anyone wants to share their experience with some of those, like the Retron, I think is the main one I'm thinking of, or the Super Boy, which is a handheld one. Uh, want to share your experience with those, send it in. I, I'd love to have that discussion, because I'm just that's just a blind spot for me. Now, as I said, I have the game on um, my Switch Lite, and as far as I can tell, it plays exactly like the arcade cabinet I used to play at Aversano's Pizza when I was a kid back in New York. Now, like all the ACA Neo Geo releases, uh, this version lets you do a quick save of your progress if you must put the game down and come back to it. Uh, also has options for playing it in Japanese or English, as well as some online leaderboards and game modes. To me, this was well worth the eight bucks or so that it cost me, and I'm glad to have it in my Switch library. So, like I said earlier, in addition to the Super Nintendo version, there was also a Sega Genesis port of this game. Like pretty much all of the 16-bit Neo Geo ports, Takara handled the adaptation, but developer Btop worked on the Genesis version, unlike the SNES port. Um, now, I tried to find some information about B-Top, and I was not really able to find much. Unfortunately, again, I think a lot of this stuff has just kind of been lost in translation over the years. But the outcome of this, uh, this turn of events is that the Genesis game, which was a North American exclusive release, like I said, takes the framework of King of the Monsters 2 and turns it into a full-on fighting game. It still retains the same stages and characters, but this change pushes the game a little bit closer to the original, in terms of gameplay, but even then, it evolves, but in a different way from the arcade game. Now, as far as characters, you're free to choose from any of the three player characters, as well as the six enemy monsters. Fomerty, though mentioned in the manual, does not make an appearance in this game, which is a little disappointing, but understandable. Once you choose your monster, you do the usual fighting game motif. You fight every other monster in a best two out of three battle in their home locale. Now, since Super Gaon, Atomic Guy, and Cyber Woo did not have home stages in the original game, new ones are added in the form of Tokyo, Kyoto, and Osaka. And these are ports of the cities from Takara's adaptation of the original King of the Monsters for the Genesis. So these three stages essentially return from the first game, which I thought was really neat. And otherwise, the stages are the same. Uh, they are a little bit smaller since they don't have the side-scrolling segments. They only have the beat-em-up segments where you would fight the boss at the end. The change to a fighting game also changes the controls around. The basics are still the same. You have one button each for punch, kick, and jump. But now, instead of holding a button to charge for a special attack, you now have to input a command like a more typical 2D fighting game. For instance, Atomic Guy's Atomic Cutter requires you to quickly input forward, back, forward, punch. This change really makes the gameplay differently. Since you don't have to stay in one place to charge of an attack, it's not as easy for an enemy to attack you while you're trying to spool up your special. Now that said, of course, the CPU is still pretty good at avoiding your attacks, just in case you forgot you were playing an SNK game. Each monster has multiple attacks, which are unlocked by obtaining power-ups from the destroyed terrain, uh, like in the arcade version. You can level up twice, with a new attack added at both levels, too. And three. So that stays the same. It's just the how you execute the moves is what changes. After you've defeated the other eight monsters, you now move to the secret hideout where you face the final boss yourself. Yes, 
What an absolutely perfect way to end a 1990s fighting game with a little mirror match action, a little atomic guy and atomic guy or have you. So that, that I thought was really neat and a way to have a boss without having to, um, I, I guess, uh, Farmerdy was a bit beyond what they could pull out of the Genesis hardware. So I thought this was a nice compromise. Uh, naturally, you can also play the game in a two-player mode, uh, but unlike the cooperative mode, two-player mode, I should say, of the original King of the Monsters 2, you now play in an endless stream of one-on-one -on -one fights, very common for the two-player modes of pretty much all fighting games in the wake of Street Fighter 2, which, uh, you know, kind of the 800-pound gorilla in the room, you know, no offense to Cyberwoo. All these changes came as a huge surprise to me as a young teenager. Now, my brother Jason had purchased a used copy of King of the Monsters 2 from Funko Land in Danbury, near the Danbury Fair Mall. Those of you in uh, the tri-state area up in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut probably know the Danbury Fair Mall. Now, for those who may be too young to recall, Funko Land was a video game shop which, as near as I can tell, was the originator of the trade-in by used games model. Now, the game did not come with a manual, unfortunately, but a little trial and error, we were able to figure out some of the attack commands. But the simple fact that the game went from being cooperative to competitive really worked for Jay and I. We played plenty of cooperative games, titles like Golden Axe and Streets of Rage, and the legendary game Bimini Run. Kenji, come in! Look that one up, folks. It's, it's such an obscure game, but we had so much fun playing Bimini Run. Uh, but making this game a competitive one in the vein of the original King of the Monsters, that was perfect for us. You know, we, we did play quite a bit of, like, uh, Street Fighter II Special Championship Edition or Mortal Kombat and other games where we went head-to-head. -head. Uh, the addition of special moves to a three-quarters overhead scrolling fighter was great as well. I mean, you could play Pit Fighter one-on-one, -on -one, you could play the dual mode in Golden Axe one-on-one, -on -one, but you still have the same regular repartee of moves. The use of special moves put this one kind of over those in terms of the gameplay experience. I mean, again, this was the 90s. This is what we were looking for. The controls themselves, they're not super silky smooth like you'd want from a fighting game, but they're not too clunky. They actually work pretty well. Attacks are pretty easy to pull off once you know what the commands are. Um, although I do have to say, any attack which requires you to tap a certain button repeatedly, going to be tough to land against a CPU. Feasible to do it against the, a human, not so much against a CPU. Just, I guess you're just not hitting it fast enough for the computer's taste. Cast is a good size, has all the strengths of the arcade version as far as uh, the monsters that are featured. And as far as I'm concerned, and, and this might be a hot take, but to me, the Genesis version of King of the Monsters 2 is bar none one of the best monster fighting games ever released on any system. No, I'll grant you, it does not have the technical advancement of games like Destroy All Monsters Melee, but for a 16-bit sprite-based game, it's the top of the admittedly small heap, and it's still a lot of fun to play now. I broke out my Genesis 1 for the purposes of this review, and it's still a lot of fun to go through this game. It's still tough. Still got to adjust that difficulty level in the options if you're playing one player, but it's a lot of fun. And two-player, it's a hoot. Uh, now, like the SNES one, this game is not readily available in any format except that original Genesis card. You can find it on eBay, but don't be too quick to pull the trigger. Be patient. The prices for a complete one can get fairly high pretty quickly. Uh, your best bet, if, um, if I can freestyle for a minute here, maybe to get just the cartridge and take a look at the controls online. There's an excellent game guide on GameFAQs.com, which has all the special moves. There's also a scan of the manual on archive.org, which is invaluable because it has all of the controls, including the special moves. So that is a key thing for this. It's not like Street Fighter 2, where at this point you can find those special moves just about anywhere. These are the only resources I've found for King of the Monsters 2. So I will try to link those in the show notes so that everybody can take a look at those as well. And, I, and I'm putting this out there into the universe. Anyone from Playmore, Hamster, Takara, anyone out there is listening, please, please figure out a way to get this game added to the ACA Neo Geo collection or any similar service. This, this game is too cool not to be out there for people to enjoy as a variant on King of the Monsters 2, which is out there. So, I mean, it's a long shot, but hey, you never know, right? Keep spreading the word, folks. All right, so now I'm going to throw it to you, the listeners. What do you think? Did you play King of the Monsters 2 back in the arcades or on your Super Nintendo or Genesis? Do you think it holds up to the original? 
Is it a letdown, or do you think it's better than the original? Write in, and we can talk about it here on the show, Earth Destruction Directive at Yahoo.com. I would really like to hear people's thoughts on this one. King of the Monsters was fairly obscure, but I think more people knew it than King of the Monsters 2. So if anyone out there has, you know, uh, any thoughts on King of the Monsters 2, I'd really like to hear them, because this game just doesn't seem to get as much love as the original. All right, that's all I've got for the next thing. The next thing for us is going to be taking a break, and then we're going to come back and do a little bit of listener feedback and close out the show, right here on Earth Destruction Directive. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jason Giaconetti. You may recognize my voice from the Vault of Starling Monster Horror Tales of Terror, and if you don't, you should be listening. But today I need to ask you a few questions. Do you like big bugs and you cannot lie? Other robots just can't deny that when the Queen of Space walks in and puts a blast in your face that your gears get sprung? Are you deep in the bee we're sharing? Are you hooked and you can't stop staring? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then have I got a podcast for you. Bots, Bugs, and Babes, the B-Movie Podcast. From classics to cults and all the yummy, yummy cheese in between. Look for my new show, Bots, Bugs, and Babes, on the Two True Freaks Network and on iTunes. That's Bots, Bugs, and Babes, the B-Movie Podcast. Double J on the Triple B is your hookup. Holler if you hear me. All right, we are back here on Earth Destruction Directive. And we are going to get into a little bit of listener feedback. If you would like to reach out to show, you can email me at earthdestructiondirective at yahoo.com. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Uh, Listen to the outro to the show, and you'll get all the information for getting in touch. So our email today comes from Robert Ludwig, the most sane man among us. And Robert lights in about Earth Destruction Directive episode number 102. Robert writes, Hi, Luke. I am a little behind in my podcast listening. I seem to catch up to some and leave others and go back and forth like this. This is a nice thing of the podcast is that they are there for me to listen to when I can. I agree with that. That is a nice thing about that. I like on demand in general for that. Um, my schedule is always so wonky, you know, with, between work and kids and other, other, uh, you know, obligations that having the ability to just say, you know what? I'll have some time this weekend or on this drive to listen to this. I don't need to stop what I'm doing right then. It's why I love VHS for time shifting, right? So I could watch shows on my schedule and not have to worry about it. I'm I'm, I'm right there with you, Robert. Uh, Robert continues, I just listened to the January episode, Ultra Marvelous, number 102. It was about comic books, which always makes me extra happy. You have a way of bringing the story and characters to life and off the page. It isn't to say I don't enjoy all the shows you do, but my favorites are the comic book ones. Now, that's fair. I mean, everybody likes what they like, right? Um, I do know some listeners are not big into comics, and so um, sometimes they fall on the side of not liking those. Sometimes they like them just because it's something different. So I'm glad that you enjoy the comic book ones, Robert. Robert continues, a little history of me and Ultraman. I had never heard of Ultraman until you did a show about him all those years ago. All of my knowledge has come from you and any guests you have had on to talk about him. I don't know if Ultraman was not shown where I lived growing up, Omaha, Nebraska, or if it was on opposite opposite a show that caught my attention more. It's always nice to learn about something new. Yeah, that's, um, you know, Ultraman was, it was only seemed to air in certain markets. It wasn't everywhere. Like I know uh, Professor Allen talks about in, uh, that he saw it as a kid, but that was in Ohio. And I know it aired on the West Coast in a lot of places. I've never gotten a lot of, a great resource for finding this did air, this did not, you know, it was kind of the wild west when it came to syndication back there in a lot of ways. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I didn't know about Ultraman until, you know, somebody told me, and that was for Ultraman towards the future, which was the, the first series in English, which I'm hoping will some point get an official release. I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, but I'm, Hey, I'm, I'm glad to be, uh, to help you, uh, you know, discover something new. I love learning new stuff especially about like pop culture and things. I always love that. One of the things I've enjoyed doing all the seasonal reading we do on Twitter for, um, you know, we, we like March was global comics month. April is uh, humor comics month is finding new stuff. Just finding things that other people uh, have such enthusiasm and affection for that you've never heard of. It's so great to just expand your horizons. Uh, Robert continues for the episode was fun listening. I was wondering where Ultraman was when you hit issue three. At first, I thought I had missed you talking about him as I was driving while listening. But then, when you said he finally appeared, I thought it was odd that it took so long in a miniseries for the hero to appear. And when you got to the cover of issue 5, your description was awesome and made me want to see it. I was home by then and went and looked it up. Yep, just as awesome. 
as you made it sound. Anyway, thank you for all the podcasts you put out. I really appreciate them. Thank you, Robert Ludwig, Nevada, Iowa. P.S. I am writing this while watching Son of Dracula on Sven Gulli on MeTV. Ooh, Son of Dracula. That's one of the first ones that used the, um, the alias Alucard for Dracula, if I remember right. I haven't seen Son of Dracula in years. I have it on VHS. I have a lot of those uh, universal horrors on VHS. I inherited them all from my dad. Uh, Robert, yeah, absolutely. It takes... I mean, it, it's such a Marvel decompressed thing, right? To have Ultraman not show up until the third issue of a five-issue mini. He's more in the sequel. Trials of Ultraman um, has, because it doesn't have to do the introduction, does feature a bit more Ultraman. I don't know if it's quite enough for my taste, but we'll cover that one eventually. And yeah, I, that that covered issue five with Ultraman and Bemular. I know I'm a sucker because I uh, Bemular is one of my favorites, but that is a cool a cool image and would make a such a nice poster. It's one of those ones you want to print it out on the like laser jet and frame it, you know, put it in a little eight by 10 frame. I could, I could go for that. Um, Robert, thank you very much for writing in. Really appreciate hearing from you. Hope you continue to enjoy the show and uh, there should be some more comics coming up. Uh, so uh, hopefully those will, those will be out and you'll enjoy those as well. Uh, social media, likes, shares, retweets, and the like. Uh, for the previous episode came in from the aforementioned Robert Ludwig, the most sane man among us, Billy D, a.k.a. Doc Strange, the Fan Holes podcast, the man they call Bob Hansen, Professor Allen, it's Jason, Nathan Marchand, and Jimmy from NASA. Together they are the Monster Island Film Vault, the Power Trip podcast, the Henshin Men podcast, Crystal Lady Jessica, my brother, Mr. Jason Giaconetti, John Vanover, Chuck Rodriguez, Derek Crab, Derek WC of the Fan Holes, Dr. Bill Robinson, Gene Gene the Podcasting Machine Hendrix, Tim Elliott, John Kilgallen, Brian Severe, and special shout out, of course, to my wife TJ, who also liked my last episode. Uh, so thank you everyone for the social media and for the feedback. I really appreciate it. I appreciate every bit of it that I get. It really helps spread the word about Earth Destruction Directive. I say it all the time, but you know, a podcast is a labor of love and that folks out there are enjoying it and appreciating what we do. It really makes it all worthwhile. So thank you for that. would also like to take an opportunity, of course, to say that Earth Destruction Directive is for everyone. If you are interested in Japanese giant monsters, however much you are, you are free to interact with the show in any way that makes you comfortable. Uh, this show is not an elitist show. We don't gatekeep here. We're here to spread the, um, the, the, the fun parts of the fandom of giant monsters, and I think it should be a fun fandom. There's a lot, you know, that we get our serious stuff. Don't get me wrong. There's serious stuff here, but at the end of the day, we're talking about, like, King of the Monsters 2. This game's nothing but fun. Except when you're screaming at the screen as you pump another quarter in to stop Clawhead from tossing you across the Grand Canyon again. But that's neither here nor there. Ultimately, like I said, if you want to be part of this show, you can interact with this show in any way that you feel comfortable. All are welcome. Now, next time, what are we going to be covering? Well, we went a little off the beaten path here with a little SNK stuff, and we're going to continue to be off the beaten path next time as we're going to be taking a look at the independent kaiju film, God Raiga vs. King Oga. Now, folks, you knew this was coming. We covered Raigo, and we covered Raiga. You knew that we were going to get to uh, God Raiga vs. King Oga. I have not seen this one. I have it from uh, SRS Cinema. I am very interested to see if it falls more on the somewhat more serious side like uh, Rago King of the Sea Monsters, or if it falls more on the comedy side, like Raga God of the Monsters, I think it's going to be more the latter than the former, if I'm going to be honest, but you know what? We will find out together, because I haven't watched it, and I'm going to watch it for this show, and then we're going to talk about it. Um, anyway, that's all I've got, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode, talking about King of the Monsters 2, uh, and I, I, I really uh, appreciate the downloads and listens. Hope everybody comes back next time, as we talk about God Raga versus King Oga, uh, as I said, please check out the show on uh, on YouTube. I still don't have that in the outro. I probably need to fix that. But if you go to YouTube, you can find us at um, you know, just search for Earth Destruction Directive, and I've been mirroring all the episodes up there, and I would really appreciate that. You can always, of course, hit that subscribe button. It does me uh, it does a lot of good, again, to help spread the word of Earth Destruction Directive. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Please come back next time. And until then, keep them stomping. This has been Earth Destruction Directive, a Daikaiju podcast. 
produced and created by me, Luke Giaconetti, as part of the Two True Freaks Internet Radio Network, available at twotruefreaks.com. This is a fan work celebrating the history and culture of Japanese giant monsters. All movies, TV shows, comic books, characters, and other intellectual property is copyright their respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended or implied. If you would like to send an email to the show, you can email me at earthdestructiondirective at yahoo.com. I try to respond to all emails, and if you send in some comments, I will read them on the show. All episodes of Earth Destruction Directive can be found at 2TrueFreaks.com. You can also find the show on your favorite podcatcher. Just search for Earth Destruction Directive. You can even leave a review on your podcatcher of choice if you'd like. You can find me on Facebook. Just search for first name Luke, last name EDD. You can also get in touch with me on Twitter. Just search for the handle at LJacone. That's L-J-A-C-O-N-E. The theme song for this podcast is Future Gladiator by Kevin MacLeod, downloaded from Incompetech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license. Thanks for listening, and be sure to come back next time for more city-stomping fun here on Earth Destruction Directive. Tune in next time to hear the crusty old podcaster from Oklahoma say, There's a WTF (laughs) moment if I ever saw one.